Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashish Sharma. And I got this chance to again uh, put these guys on spot and ask them questions. And uh, uh, I'll really appreciate your help here. So I did get a bunch of questions from the audience. And I'll try to actually use these questions. But I do have uh, some questions which I came up with help of Janet as well. And uh, the idea is to actually get to know these guys, what their thinking is, where bro is going, what our concerns are, or like uh, things like Robin, why is connection.cc has that pointer to that structure or something on those lines too. So uh, anyways, uh, uh, the, <laughs> let's just have a round of introduction here. So how about uh, each one of you actually tell uh, briefly what your name is and what your role in Bro Project is, actually. So. I'm Seth Hall. Uh, mostly what I do is uh, say, wouldn't it be awesome if? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's probably about it. <laughs> I'm on the other side of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm Robin Sommer. Um, I've been involved with the project since 2002, I believe, when I came out to Berkeley as Vern's intern. Um, <coughs> and then I came back again as Vern's intern the following year. And then I finished my, my studies in, 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 in Munich in Germany and afterwards returned uh, kind of permanently, I guess, to Berkeley again and have been involved in, with Bro since then. Uh, I'm Adam Slegel. I'm, uh, I've been involved with Bro, with the Bro project since 2010. It's been about five years since um, I joined the team, and I'm co-PI with uh, Robin and Vern on a few of the NSF rewards. And we've been a user of Bro for 15 years almost now, since I think Ashish might have been the first person running it at NCSA. Um, it's been a fun ride. Uh, I'm Vern Paxson, and uh, you heard my involvement in Bro uh, Tuesday morning. And these days, I mostly just sit back and watch in awe, as <laughs> everyone else does great work. And, and complain <laughs> about things that I didn't bring from the old bro <laughs> in scripts. Uh, I do or when we broke old things. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Justin Azoff. What am, what am I supposed to be saying? Uh, your role in the project. W w what's your role in the bro project? W what do you do? Uh, kind of split, I guess, between operational and programming things like working on bro control, random scripts. Very interested in this new net control framework because of the work I did with the Arista. <coughs> so uh, I've been using bro since 2009 and I guess officially working on the project since 2013? Yeah, about two years. So this actually, this conferen uh, from conference was pretty good actually. I was amazed when I saw the amount of people here while walking on the very first day morning. So, and I think the very first Bro workshop was, I believe, in 2006 in Tampa, Florida. So, and since then, there has been workshop almost every year. So the deal is, uh, Vern, what took so long? <laughs> <laughs> right, well, I, I tried to, to, to frame that in my, uh, my overview. Um, I think one key thing is Bro, came heavily out of research. And in research land, we don't do polished products that are, that are actually uh, designed for widespread use because that's not novel scientific contribution, which is what researchers do. And, and so it really took this uh, combination of factors of, of uh, being able to support building up a team that would do that and also as, as, as I framed earlier, um, finding that team and then the, the key set of people who really both understood the paradigm and were passionate about it and wanted to pursue it in depth. So. And uh, a follow-up question on that is, what took so long for you to show up here? In the <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it, there, there's a, a, a some. Uh, a, a mundane reason and a deeper reason. And the mundane reason is that uh, August, when a lot of these events are, is when Usenix Security is, and when SIGCOM is. And, and while I don't go to SIGCOM much, I go to Usenix Security all the time. And I try not to put too much travel imposed on my family. <clears throat> That's the mundane reason. 
the deep reason is that, uh, you know, truth be told, bro is not really my focus these days. And, you know, Robin uh, became the lead of, of bro and, and where it's going in, in around 2010 with the, the first grant. And, you know, I do stuff like, you know, censorship research and cybercrime and, uh, you know, I still love working on like detection algorithms and the like, and we have some of that going on. But, but you know, it hasn't been the front and center of what I do. I think we got them with the cakes. <laughs> <laughs> Those were cool cakes. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, another thing is, it's always useful to get an insight about uh, like how Bro Project is going forward. Like we saw the roadmap, and you mentioned about this team and building up a Bro team and how Bro team works. Adam mentioned about this interaction between NCS and XC. So how actually is like a day-to-day -day meeting or how internally the bro team is working, how you are actually interacting with each other, how does that go? Um, I do video conferences with people all the time, with you and Robin and Johanna and Adam and Justin and Matthias and Matthias and Doris. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on video conferences a lot. That's that's my thing. I frequently I will coordinate between the people in Berkeley from Ohio. It's great. I'll, I'll go down the hall of people talking to all of them. But that, I mean that's a lot of my coordination is, mm -hmm. is video conferencing. I yeah, I guess the, the the more general answer is very unstructured. I mean we don't have much of an actual process. Um, people usually take on what they like to take on. I mean we are not you, you try to not force stuff on people. Doesn't always work, but but in general, I think it's 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 working pretty out pretty well, um, and it's really about having the right people on the team so that that works. And and I think over time we have we have these these core people, but we also had like a number of contributors who were kind of fine with that mentality of taking on a certain project and really diving into that, and and making sure that it was in a shape afterwards to to be merged in, but all in a in a very unstructured way. And sometimes it takes a while. Um, which is our bro releases. They, they take a while and they have new features. Sometimes um, we are talking about new features like for years, literally for years before they materialize in any release. And, and that is the outcome of this very unstructured process. But at the same time, um, it helps us to kind of really make it crisp to really understand what we want and, and in the end how the API, for example, is supposed to look like. You know, I can attest definitely to if I want to get hold of Seth, it's just call Seth up, and that's that's his primary mode of communication. But, you know, it, it's structured and unstructured. We have uh, weekly NCSA meetings. I have a weekly call with Robin. We have a somewhat weekly-ish <laughs> all-team call. But a lot of it's just like, you know, people commenting on uh, commits, you know, or on a ticket, or in IRC. I think Justin's always on IRC. You know, it's, it's different people communicate different ways, but we managed to get enough overlap so that we're all uh, fairly connected. So uh, another in interesting part is like, what part of Bro are you actually most proud of, each one of you? <coughs> uh, is there any like favorite policies you guys have written, or is there any favorite component of Bro, or like some part of Bro which was more challenging than another? Well, for me, it was the match using statement. That's a joke. Oh, the, the one that I got <laughs> removed? <laughs> <laughs> Took forever um, to get the notice filtering right. And match using was this, I, I'm embarrassed I designed it and implemented it and inflicted it upon all the early users, except it, it at least did something in that log. I, I think you may be talking about something that no one in here even is aware well, all right. of. All right. <laughs> all right. You should be grateful. I, I remember that, and I never really minded it. Yes, but, it was but only then used. you rewrote it, and I'm like, wow, that's a lot simpler. Why didn't we have that before? Right. Yeah, well, it, it came from when I was doing the 2.0. I mean, for, for, me, for me personally, I think it was uh, the, the, the script rewriting stuff that I did from the 1 to the 2 release. I still can't believe I did that. It was astonishing, but I remember I would have weeks where I was up 3 a.m. every single night <laughs> just for like weeks on end. Because uh, everyone should go download Bro 1.5 and look try at the bro. scripts and then look at <laughs> Yeah, don't the, download. Do try Bro. <laughs> well, but you don't see the scripts. Oh, I mean, right, it's, right, yeah. it, and it, was, it was like no one's fault that it ended up that way. It's just that um, the system had been designed and the scripts were written together. And it's really hard. I, I imagine it's very hard to have a cohesive 
structured approach to that. I mean, there was just no way that could have happened. And Robin told me a thousand times not to rewrite all the scripts, and I did it anyway. So, and Seth never, never listens to anything I'm saying, so that's, that's why Bro is actually working so well. <laughs> so, so uh, like, Bro is 20 years old now, and there was this C++ code written back in 94, and then there's this code written now in 2015. So how do you internally see the design decisions, and do you like regret any of those? Do you think those, like one covered quite a bit of that in his uh, keynote, but as programmers, like did, did you evolve over the period of time, and like, yeah, these are good ideas. Like for example, uh, broker has been written now, and then there are objections that the design may not be right, but you think that design is right. So do you have to revisit things like this often and over a period of time? Mm -hmm. so, so maybe and I'm, how does yeah. those design decisions actually get in effect? Yeah. I mean, maybe first, I, I, I can only second what, what Vern said in the, in, the, in the keynote. I mean, it's, I think the design has proven, the, the, the basic design of Pro has proven to be right. I mean, Vern got it exactly right with this basic structure. And it's, if, you, if you look at the code back then and now, it has still the same structure. I mean, lots of stuff have changed, but, but this, this basic model is in place, and that has really um, proven over time that is, it is the right approach for this. Um, then, of course, there's lots of stuff in there which over time has changed. The communication code, I was talking about that in my broker code. I mean, there's certainly a lot of stuff I would be doing quite different today. Um, there's a lot of complexity, the communication introduced into the code, which we still suffer from today. And I will be the first person really cheering when, once we can get, of, can, can get rid of that. Um, but that's a learning experience. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it was wrong to do that in the first place, I think. Um, the other piece to that is that, that, I mean, even a language like C++ evolves over time. So there, there are artifacts in the code which are just there because the code was started in 1995. And, and C++ was a much different language at that point. Sure, would be nicer today if maybe templates were, be were being used all over the place, uh, but that's something which you can't change easily after the fact. So it's, it's a bit of an artifact of, of the age, and given that, I think it's an amazing shape, honestly. I'd add one, one thing to that, which is that um, uh, I think, well, I absorbed from, from you know, the education I got in software engineering, and then and the Bro Project has continued, um, to have this discipline of being really requiring use cases to change things and avoiding featurism. Um, and and there, there's always a lot of tension with that. And, and we still have quite a bit of discussion on, on featurism or, on, or removing features. And one of the uh, things that, while I still bug Seth about some of the details, one of the things that occurred when uh, all the rewriting happened of the scripts and so forth. It was removing a lot of feature features that had crept in over time, and I think that that was great. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and in general, I think that, that uh, it, it's that deliberative process that um, makes things slower, um, but actually makes them strategically viable long term. And so I've been really pleased with how that's continued, um, though I'll, I'll also keep hassling people mm -hmm. over features. <laughs> So and, uh, I'll just pick one of the questions from audience. So, and this is an interesting question. Like uh, I'll just phrase it as is: Will Bro go dark as more gets encrypted? And what are your thoughts on detecting badness in spite of in encryption? Let me start on that because that came up in like 1998. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's all encrypted, and and I'm I'm still amazed that um, you know. No, it's not. Um, and uh, you, we've long had a series of views on that. One is um, uh, the fact that uh, you can instrument in hosts, and, and you know Scott talked a bunch about instrumented SSHD, which was one of the one of the uh, things going dark pain points. Another is I'm just personally really interested in how this tussle is going to play out, where institutes, enterprises, they want visibility and, uh, and control the network. And so um, it wouldn't surprise me is it, you still have points where things are decrypted. You've got HTTPS proxies mm -hmm. and so forth. You've got yeah. uh, Bastion hosts where your SSH mm -hmm. goes through, and you'll still see it in the clear. Um, now, 
in such architectures, you haven't, you don't need a network sniffer to do it, but you would, it, it would might make a whole lot of sense. So you're still running Perl on that box. It's just now it's reading uh, byte streams rather than packets, you know. And but all the rest of it will still uh, uh, carry over. With with my CISO hat on, I, I'm. I think about this a fair amount, and this is why I always, you know, pay attention to what Scott's doing because he's always trying to pull in that system data. We're never going to be a place that does, you know, HTTPS proxies. That's that's for sure at NCSA. But you know, we're losing visibility. It's not just through encryption; it's it's through outsourcing certain things too. So, what worries me more sometimes is, you know, we've outsourced our email now. We don't have NCSA email; they're just aliases to campus mail addresses. So we've lost visibility into that, and I was really feeling that when I was watching Ashish and Vincent's talk, is we don't have that source of information anymore. We uh, don't run our own wireless anymore, and that's off to campus. So then we, you know, there are people with laptops who we never actually see any traffic from their laptops, because, but they work for NCSA. Uh, I think the, you know, some of the approaches to how we're dealing with this, you know, we're not gonna handle it, we're not gonna do it the corporate way with HTTPS proxies, but, you know, we're gonna look at the things that Scott's doing more. You know, we're using his ISSHD. Um, we're probably going to be looking more statistically at analysis there as well. Um, I think that's going to become a little more important over time. But more, I think, is I'm starting to think about intelligence and how we can share intelligence in the community and get that around. I think that's going to be uh, extremely important and keeps getting more important. And some of the projects we're working on now is actually trying to make that easier and trying to do that in other communities like Exceed. Let me add one thing. I, th I think there's another form of losing visibility, which is just layer seven complexity. Mm. And you've got so much crap ladled on top of HTTP and Ajax, Ajax and JavaScript, uh. and, you know. And, and so that, mm. uh, while in principle with enough go fast, you can actually somewhat analyze it, um, it, it, it it's, that's a huge hurdle. And you can't analyze it passively watching it um, with full context because it can draw upon things in the browser or whatever that you just don't know what how that JavaScript's going to execute. <clears throat> yeah. I, I, I almost sort of wonder if that complexity is, is just, it's almost going to naturally arise as more of the human complexity of the world moves onto these networks yeah. where yeah. it's just that yeah. humans and the world are incredibly complicated right. yeah. and that's just now really showing up in the in the network traffic. We're, we're even seeing it, so I'm wondering how this affects, and I need to talk to Scott about this, but you know, I had a student come and he's like, well, I use this Vim uh, shell-like thing and I hop around my terminal with just the keys for Vim and all this and I have no idea if we're actually reconstructing his keystrokes and commands very well in ISSHD. It's kind of like, you know, an analogous to sort of like the Ajax client trying to figure out all that complexity. <laughs> and <laughs> so, uh, going from the, I picked the word intelligence sharing, so from there actually this is the most classic question which comes up almost every year in Brocon. Hmm. How do we manage all these gazillions of uh, bro scripts which are actually coming up from different users and how can people benefit from it? Well, the answer is always kind of similar and unfortunately we haven't been making a lot of progress. <laughs> so, so we have this vision that eventually we we'll hopefully will have a central script repository and uh, maybe there are additional like external script re repositories maintained by, by other people. And we have a software like um, PyPy or, or, or yeah. CPAN for Perl, where it's really easy. It might it's probably integrated into Bro Control, and you just say, okay, install, package, and we'll download it, and we'll update the latest version later. Um, that's actually maybe a call out to the community here. We are really looking for somebody to take this on. So we haven't found the right person <coughs> yet, maybe with some solid Python skills probably, um, to really pull this off. Well, there's that technical aspect, but there's also the social aspect. How do we yep. vet these and trust? that they're, you know, good or do what we think they're going to do. I mean, people can write a script and easily make one that consumes a lot of memory. So we'd have to really vet something before we roll yeah. it into the official release. Right. I so think we, plugins are probably where we're going to see this more maybe than even um, the scripts. I, I think the, the scripts and the plugins are probably going to merge at some point. So, mm -hmm. so they are both just essentially a package you're downloading and, and they're coming out with scripts or source code that needs to be compiled, but it's there's probably a unified model for that. Mm -hmm. I would say if, if we had the system, we would probably have a, like a cu curated um, repository in our end yeah. 
yeah. where yes, not every script just appears in there, but somebody's actually taking a look at that and, and maybe giving it a trial run for a while um, to, to have some kind of confidence in there. So you want somebody to make a bro store? A bro, a bro store? App <laughs> store. <laughs> no. So, so there is another very interesting uh, uh, idea from audience and uh, uh, like people really miss having an SMB analyzer. So, uh, wait, wait, miss having one? Yeah, like they, everybody wants an SMB oh, analyzer. Okay. Okay. So, so the idea actually is like, can we crowdsource fund SMB analyzer and what, what's your <laughs> opinion and thoughts about doing that? That's for Seth. I, I don't know. <laughs> so I, I think one of the issues with that is um, individuals can, from a crowdsourcing perspective, individuals don't have much of a problem with that. But I don't think companies have a very easy time with that because it's sort of this amorphous, unknown thing that you know. Can how many how many large companies would be able to contribute to a Kickstarter? Probably zero, <laughs> maybe one, but. Um, uh, yeah, I, I really don't know how much that would work. I mean, that's always been one of the things that I've thought about because that's it's just is such a massive amount of work to make not, uh, an SMB analyzer that not only works but uh, does something really useful and also is, is validated that it works. That's that's sort of the <coughs> last tweak there where we really don't want to merge it back into Bro until it's at least made a real solid run at validating that it works because it's just complicated enough. So, so the, is problem funds or is problem uh, uh, some human resource, like good person who can actually be able to finish that analyzer? I think resources. It, it's probably some mix of all three. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's yeah. probably my thoughts. Yeah. So the, the bar is just very high to actually come to a good solution here. Mm -hmm. And that, that includes all, the, all those points, I think. And, and, and actually, I mean, to be honest, it's not like uh, there are SMB analyzers for other things, but um, at one point there was a bug I almost put into our SMB analyzer when I was working on it that was because I was looking at SMB and Wireshark and theirs had a bug. And so I almost just implemented that bug into ours until I realized that it was showing me the wrong thing. So going into a slightly lighter side in the conversation, uh, question for I think primarily Robin and Seth. Why do you not like uh, 172.16 slash 12? Because it is missing from networks.cfg. Oh, the other RFC 1918 is yes. like a weird. It's not in there? No. Oh. So why don't you like it? And sorry about that. And some, why, someone, why, one of us, I guess, should say course. sorry. <laughs> but I would ask, why have you not filed a patch? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, not sure who submitted this, but please file a ticket. Oh, yeah, whoever. Okay. I'll take Pull it. request, please. So, but going into the bigger uh, uh, idea is like when you come across problems, I think it's a good idea to either send it to bro mailing list or file a ticket. Yeah. So, right? Take yeah, the, right. T tickets for, for problems. And if you have patches, GitHub pull request is the easiest thing to do. We'll integrate it. Uh, so, going back to one, actually, uh, there are a couple of questions I personally would want to know. One of them is uh, pre-Bro, before Bro existed, did you catch any in interesting incident? Which I, I think I have heard somewhere in lab stories about things. So is there any story there? Yeah, right. So um, th there, there were a couple interesting incidents, um, one pre-Bro, one just post-Bro. Uh, the pre-Bro one was in 1995. and this was when the nightly scripts that were looking for various forms of activity found um, apparently uh, some one of our key systems connecting to itself. And uh, that didn't seem very likely to have crossed our border. And this turned out to be a Mitnick-style IP spoofing attack coming about uh, <coughs> I think it was six months after Mitnick attacked Shimomura. And, uh, you know, and we had the, the traces and stuff, and could, could watch trying to guess the sequence numbers and the like. And so this was somebody having a tool like Mitnick's. And, and, and so we started tracing this activity, and uh, the attacker uh, broke into a bunch of systems we, we, we could find, um, but turned to using uh, NFS attacks uh, and just went to town. And um, so part of what was dicey was that 
we had visibility in a lot of this activity, even though it wasn't our computers being attacked. And that's because it was on this FTDI ring and uh, that we shared with others in the Bay Area, and so transit traffic would go through it, and we had to talk with our legal folks, are, are we allowed to even look at this? And they determined, yeah, we are. And, and all summer long, we would watch this attacker break into systems across California and, and even further mm -hmm. away, and we would file it all with cert and the like. Mm -hmm. And uh, and along the way, and, and we're doing full packet capture, um, we caught chat sessions where the, the guys talking with other people. Um, one of the transcripts that was really frustrating is when he's, the other guy was about to ask, basically, who are you? And and the uh, attacker said, oh, you never know who's who might be sniffing the wire. And so I'm not going to tell you. And it's like, oh, uh, <laughs> and I had the guy. Um, and uh, when I uh, did the Broad paper, um, uh, a few years later, at using security, I talked with some guys from the loft, you know, in the gray hats, and mentioned this event and mentioned the attacker's tool uh, was called Mendax. Um, and, you know, we knew that because they would just leave Mendax.tar lying around or whatever. And the, um, one of the guys from the loft said, oh, that's Proth. And uh, Proth was the handle of a guy who ran the best of security white hat mailing list. And uh, it turned out that Prof wasn't total white hat. Um, the more interesting thing that I alluded to in my keynote is Prof's real name was Julian Assange. And if you go to <laughs> Assange's uh, webpage today, you'll see that his hacker handle was Mendax. Um, so way back in 95, he was busy uh, filling our summer with uh, filing cert and SIAC reports. <laughs> um, the other event that was interesting came when we were running Bro, and the in 98, I believe it was, there was a uh, over, buffer overflow attack in Bind. And this was really nasty because mm -hmm. it meant your name servers were vulnerable, and we caught uh, these attacks on LBLs and Berkeley's uh, name servers. And the uh, attacker got into some of our systems and was reading our email as we discussed the oh. incident and sent me a note. Um, basically, it, it's a bizarre note because it starts off saying, you know, hey, I found these incredible vulnerabilities in your systems and I'm doing you a favor and boy, it was really kind of clever how I did it all and, and it keeps going and at the end it says, uh, you know, uh, I wonder what Shimomura is up to now and then he finally says, this is actually kind of lame. You know, I'm sounding lame. And then he stopped the note. And it turned out this guy ran a, a company called whitehats.com. So I don't know what it is about these, these white hat people who are, in fact, attackers. He was also an FBI informant, um, uh, Max Vision. You may, may if you know your, your history, may know the guy. Mm -hmm. So he was busted in part on our bro logs and uh, did time on that, uh, and I believe then went out, did fraudulent credit card stuff, and is mm -hmm. now back in prison. So, <laughs> ah. so that's, that's quite interesting. Have you thought about writing a book about all these stories? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have not. <laughs> so, uh, uh, another, actually, audience question here is, uh, so there has been talk about bro running in cluster mode on 10 gig lengths, 100 gig lengths, but there was this little mention about D bro. So is there like, what's your opinion about running bro, like 10,000 instances of bro in a big uh, network, like in hospital system or like big uh, university network or like something like that, where there is this 10,000 very little instance of bro. So every concentration is on how big the pipe is rather than how broad the visibility is. And are you planning, like, do we expect that in like 2.6, 2.7, something like that? <laughs> I, I, think, I think that's, that's one of the directions of the work that we're doing now will end up aiming for. I mean, a, a lot of, at least personally for, for me, my thinking around a lot of that was uh, you've got, well, I guess the, the real, the reason years ago I started thinking down that route was uh, we were monitoring at our border and we had a big cluster running there, but we realized we also needed visibility in front of our central DNS servers. And so we were putting 
instances in front of both of those off span ports. And then we also wanted to monitor in front of our um, VPN service. As people have said, you know, there's these places in your network that are like very critical and you want to know. But we also wanted to monitor in front of uh, the data center network and all of these different things because we kind of, within certain trust zones, we wanted to know what was going on in the network. And that was sort of the, the, where it came from. But I, I think the idea scales to running these extremely dispersed installations as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that's something we'll accidentally cover. <laughs> and uh, another thing is, so Bro is pretty mature. It's production. A lot of people are using it. A lot of places are using it in a manner which surprises everyone. So as Bro team, what is your biggest concern about Bro project? And uh, what actually keeps you worried about this? So, for me, I, I think it's uh, long-term funding for development and <coughs> finding a model that works to continue for the next 10, 20 years. Um, I really have high hopes for the foundation. That's probably the contribution that I'm most proud of, and I'm hoping eventually this can be another funding model and we can get companies to support it. And I hope, you know, Brawl is a leader in companies that support the foundation and, and others. I hope we can build a community around this. But long-term funding, it's always hard. You know, NSF is at its core still about <coughs> funding research. And so we can't depend on just NSF to fund us forever for all of our development work. And uh, what's your expectation from Bro user community in this regard? Like, uh, in terms of giving policies, giving funding, giving donations, giving uh, human resource time, giving contributions in code patches? Well, I have a hope that, at least from the companies that are using, depending on Bro, there's a lot of Fortune 50 companies out there. I'm hoping eventually they'll start supporting the foundation, and the foundation can be used for community-driven development. And from, so, the, from, uh, from the user side, I would, I would say, I mean, we have over the last couple of years, we have seen an, a, a steady increase, I think, in, in contributions and people just using it and then putting scripts mm -hmm. up on GitHub, writing blog yeah. postings. I mean, the, the community is really, the active community is, I mean, mm -hmm. we always had a broad community, but it was mostly passive for a long time, where people kind of used it, but ne don't necessarily, weren't necessarily talking about it or actually actively putting stuff out. And that is changing, and that is very encouraging. Yeah, I mean, I liked Vern's slide on that too, documenting that growth. Yeah, yep. I, I, I kind of get the sense that what happened is it's actually helpful that everyone's talking about it and, and doing all these blog posts because I, I think, and I, I don't know for sure, but I think what was happening for an awfully long time is um, like sort of defensive teams don't like sharing what they're doing because suddenly that, you know, from an attacker's perspective, you're sort of <laughs> training the attackers to be aware of what you're doing. but. We, you know, we'd always noticed, like in the, the Snort community, that there's a lot of sharing and a lot of public stuff, and there's a lot, lots of non-public as well. But as people start sharing the fact that they're using Bro more and more, it makes people less worried to share, because suddenly you're just doing many of the same things and with maybe small differences that, that many other people are doing. And it's sort of this this blossoming where suddenly, you know, the fact that 10 other people have written blog posts, it's not so weird because for a long time, Bro is like this special secret and everyone r that ran it was like, I'm different than, than everyone else and I have this special thing that makes us able to do better. And, and if you talk about that publicly, attackers, you're, the concern at least, and I always had that concern a little bit, that you know, the attackers are also paying attention, which they're probably not, and I say that now, <coughs> some attacker's gonna watch this video. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, I think that that's a big part of it, is as more people share, there's less sort of tension there, because you, you, you're, you're not running, you, you don't have a secret weapon anymore, because everyone's running the sort of secret weapon. You know, one interesting milestone we had, and this tells me, uh, it's another metric that the community's looking at bro more, is we had our first CVEs this year, uh, which were actually found yeah. and turned in. We had to develop processes for how to handle these security uh, bugs that come in. So that tells me it's definitely the community is growing and people are looking deep into it. I should say on the upside, those CVEs were very would have been very difficult to exploit. So <laughs> I, I believe they would because it was a threading thing, and you would have to whatever. It'd be very difficult to exploit. Them. I think they were both related to that. But, but it's, it's good, actually, to see that, that kind of yeah. feedback, yeah. which causes us to uh, go through the process. 
And at this point, uh, I'll just invite anybody from audience if somebody has any questions for the panel. If not, send your questions to bro mailing list. So I'd like to thank everybody on the panel here. And uh, uh, good job. <laughs> thank you, Ashish. Thanks, Ashish. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for running, bro. It's, it's so exciting to actually build something as a, as a programmer and uh, a th as th thinking about these problems, it's so exciting to have people agree with you and actually, <laughs> and, and actually use something Seth needs more yes, man. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, Vern must feel this more than anyone, but um, it's, it's, it's just incredibly exciting for other people to actually acknowledge what you've done and go, I, you know, I agree or I think that's right or, or anything like that. It, it's, it was an awfully long time where it, what, it wasn't like that. <laughs> and thank you for choosing us over Black Hat. No. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I have an audience participation question. I'm curious after talking to people. Mm -hmm. Could you do a poll of how many people are actually running a bro and a lots of bro and are getting ready to bro? Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah, that's that's really good question. Uh, so how many people are running a bro? So about a dozen people. And lots of bros. Wow. <laughs> That's, and are planning to run bro. Oh. Does that leave you anybody know. who so, didn't raise their hand? So, so sort of continuing my comment earlier, I love every time that there's a company. I, I'm, I have to apologize for this also. Every time a company that shows up in the news and uh, for maybe not so great reasons, and they run bro, I, there's something almost exciting there where I'm like, they may have accidentally shown up in the news because they had bro and they actually managed to find this problem. So there's something sort of uh, perversely exciting there. <laughs> so uh, just to summarize, because not everybody in the audience can see each other, so there is about a dozen people who run an instance of bro, about 18 to 20 people who run multiple instances of Bro, and there is a very few people who actually are planning to run Bro right now. So, cool. So, all right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.